Okay, let's get this rolling. So hello, everybody. I'm super sad that I'm not there. Uh, when you're watching this, I will also be on a flight home from Hawaii. So I will be extra sad because I'll be leaving paradise. Or who knows, maybe I will not be on a plane because I decided to stay and never come back. But anyways, I'm really sad to not be in person. I love meeting everybody. I love meeting the providers as well. And um, this was the the next best thing we could do was send in a recording. And I love educating and I love educating on this topic, especially because it's very talked about and it's a very big problem that women are facing and they're not getting the proper support. And we'll talk about that more as we go on, but I am going to talk about the root causes of hormone dysfunction. So a lot of times we focus on our hormones being out of balance, but we don't focus on the why. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So a little background about me first, I was born and raised here. I grew up playing soccer all my life. And I don't tell you that because I can't hang up the cleats, but because that is what led me to functional medicine. I had a lot of fatigue issues, especially GI issues on top of that, that was probably causing a lot of the fatigue issues. And so at that time, when I went through that process myself, I realized it's the coolest thing in the whole wide world. And why is everybody not doing that? So I went to chiropractic school, studied both of them at the same time, really fell in love with the functional medicine side. And that is what I practice today. So functional medicine is very much root cause medicine, hence the PowerPoint, hence the presentation. I help people figure out why they're having whatever symptoms they're having, why they're dealing with whatever chronic disease they're dealing with, whether it be gut issues, hormone issues, low energy, autoimmunities, cardiovascular and mental, emotional kind of anything that's chronic or, you know, things that people can't get answers for. My job is to help people discover that. So my training is through the Institute for Functional Medicine. I currently practice at Delta Health, which is in Clive, Iowa. We have chiropractors, we have massage therapists, and then I am the functional medicine doctor. All right, before we dive in, I want you to kind of think about your hormones and to have this idea about your hormones and really a lot of things health, but we're talking about hormones today. I want you to think about how they're kind of like the Goldilocks analogy. So when we have too little of hormones, certain hormones that can cause symptoms and issues, but then on the other side, if there's too much of a certain hormone that can cause issues as well. So we like things to be kind of right down the middle in their happy spot. And again, that goes for most things, health, most things, supplements and, and lab markers and all of those things. But today we're going to focus on the hormone side. So with estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, those are your three main sex hormones that we're really going to talk about and focus on today. Estrogen, we have issues again with just too little and too much. So when we see too little of estrogen, that can lead to low energy. It can lead to fertility issues. We need enough estrogen to ovulate. And without ovulation, we of course cannot make a baby. And then there's also been risks with cardiovascular as well as bone loss when we have too little of estrogen. On the other, on the other side, and you kind of what people experience more often is excess estrogen or estrogen dominance. So that can lead to PMS symptoms, fibroids, endometriosis, those issues, but also mood swings, really heavy periods, heavy cramping. Um, yeah, a lot of those common PMS symptoms, but then also perimenopause symptoms as well. So we'll talk about that as we go on, but estrogen dominance is a big, big issue because it can also lead to those estrogen dependent cancers like breast cancer, for example, progesterone. It's not really a thing to have too much progesterone or not really, you know, a problem to have too much progesterone and doesn't really happen, but we can have too little of progesterone. So progesterone is very important to get pregnant and then also maintain a pregnancy. So too little progesterone could lead to infertility issues as well as repeated miscarriages. Progesterone is also our chill hormone. So if we don't have enough, we have mood swing issues. We have irritability. We have, you know, depression and anxiety as well. So that, that progesterone is very great at keeping our mood nice and balanced. Testosterone. Yes. Females do have testosterone. We have a lot less than men should men do. We should have a lot less than men do, but we do have some, and it's very important. So too little of testosterone can lead to low libido and low energy. Those are two really common things. And then too much testosterone can then of course lead to symptoms like hair growth in places we do not want it, that men often have it. Uh, acne is a, another one, oily skin. And then also um, 
hair loss in areas that we don't want it. So kind of that balding pattern. So all of those, all of those too high, too low, that's what leads to a lot of our common hormone symptoms. And what we see with perimenopause is this shift in our hormones. And so first of all, everybody's different. So symptoms are going to show up different. The way your hormones move throughout the month is different than the woman next to you. Your cycles will differ per month, especially in the perimenopause transition. You know, your cycles might be longer, they might be shorter, and they might change every four months. So it's it's hard to say, uh, you know, what's going on with every patient at all time, because lots of things shift, but it's about balancing and making sure that we can balance our hormones and not have those dramatic symptoms as we go through this process. So with perimenopause, and when we start to transition out of our cycles, the first thing that's going to drop is progesterone. So you can kind of see on that graph there, that's the purple line, and that will drop faster than estrogen will. So they'll both drop, but progesterone will go first and a little bit faster. So then that's what leads to a lot of those symptoms. So like I talked about with um, estrogen dominance and progesterone being too low, causing symptoms, they're also a balancing act. So progesterone and estrogen really balance each other. And especially progesterone balances estrogen. And when we have too little progesterone, that can look like estrogen excess to the body, even if estrogen is at its normal levels. So if progesterone is too, too low and it's not there to balance estrogen, then that leads to what looks like estrogen excess or estrogen dominance by the body. So that often is what's leading to a lot of those heavy bleeding, the mood swings, hot flashes, especially when we are going through that perimenopause change. Again, estrogen might not be too low, but progesterone is lower than it should be and it can't balance. And then of course, when we stop ovulating, that leads to lower progesterone as well, because once we ovulate, that allows the corpus luteum to be released and that will give off progesterone. And so if that ovulation isn't happening, then we have less, less progesterone. And then again, that adds to that estrogen dominance type picture. And before I even move on, I like to also say, and I kind of mentioned this at the beginning is that we get so focused on those hormonal symptoms, because yes, they can be miserable. They can be really hard and, and that's totally fair, but we have to think about why they're happening in the first place. What's leading to an estrogen dominance picture. What's leading to too little progesterone. Yes. Your natural shifts in your cycles and transitioning into perimen perimenopause happens and there's hormone changes, but what's making them so dramatic and why is our body not able to balance that and handle it? We should have a fine transition from you know, pre-menopause into menopause. It shouldn't be this thing that everybody fears and talks about so negatively. Hundreds of years ago, it was celebrated, you know, as this, as this great transition. And now it's just looked at so negatively and that's, it, it shouldn't be looked at that way. And unfortunately with all the symptoms, with all these issues that people are having, of course, you know, it makes sense that it, it can be viewed that way, but it shouldn't be that way. And that's again, just because one of my favorite sayings is just because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal. And this would be one of those things. And I hear often from people's primary care or people tell me that their primary care doctors or their OBGYNs told them, you know, it sucks. You're just a woman and this is what happens, but don't settle for that. That's absolutely not correct. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to help manage hot flashes, to help manage the mood swings, the heavy periods and things like that. And birth control is not the only answer. There's so much we can do. And we're going to talk about that, but just know that advocate for your health, advocate for those symptoms. And if, if it's not right, and it's not serving your life and your body, you know, find somebody who's going to actually fight to find those answers and, and, um, give you a path towards healing and feeling good. Okay. So the root causes of hormone dysfunction, we're going to spend a lot of time on this slide because obviously there's a lot going on. So what you're going to see on the top is a lot of the root causes of hormone dysfunction and what leads to, you know, falling out of that Goldilocks analogy too high or too little of hormones. And then of course, hormone dysfunction in the middle. And then on the bottom, you're going to see several different hormone imbalance type symptoms. A lot of those I listed when we were talking about the specific hormones, but we'll continue to talk about them as well. So we'll start from the left and work our way across. So toxicity and poor detoxification. So our liver, our liver, we hear about all the time. It serves hundreds of different functions in our body, but one of its most popular and one of its biggest is detoxing. So that's detoxing all the things we bring into our body, but also the things that our body makes as well. So estrogen is one of those things that our body makes. 
and there's different things that we can bring in that can um, mimic estrogen, but that's, that's a whole different topic. Anyways, our liver has to break down that estrogen. And if our liver is bogged down or it's already too toxic because it's dealing with all the excess toxicity from our food, from the things we put on our body, from the things that we clean, um, from the things that we breathe in, drink, you know, kind of whatever it is, if our liver is too, too bogged down by that, then it is not able to properly detox estrogen. Estrogen is, it's, it's there to serve its purpose, but then when we are done, it should be broken down and excreted from the body. And so if that doesn't happen because our liver can't do it, then that leads to estrogen excess. That estrogen continues to stay in the body, float around and lead to too much estrogen in the body. And that can lead to, like we talked about the heavy periods, the mood swings, the hot flashes and things that we see commonly in perimenopause. GI dysbiosis. So GI issues or in issues with our microbiome. So our microbiome is our ecosystem of bacteria in our gut. Everybody's heard of probiotics and they can be great. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but the health of those bacteria in our gut is not only massively important to our gut health, but it's massively important to our full body health and hormones being a big piece of that. So you'll hear gut health and, and the microbiome in my office over and over again, because that's where a lot of issues start and where we have to focus our attention a lot. Hormones are no different. So those bacteria in our gut actually help us detox hormones as well. So our liver gets a lot of attention on detoxing, but our gut is just as important for detoxing as well. So one, the bacteria help, but then two, if we're not having proper bowel movements, then of course, toxicity just sits inside of us inflammation and insulin. So these two, of course, are two separate processes a little bit. They both can fuel one another. Inflammation can fuel more insulin. Insulin can fuel more inflammation. So I kind of put them together, but they are, they are separate, but they are, are different at the same time. So inflammation, of course, we've heard of, it's a lot of the basis of chronic disease and hormone issues is again, no exception there. Insulin comes from improper balances in our blood sugar. So Blood sugar, of course, is very diet focused. If we're bringing in lots of processed food, lots of refined carbohydrates that causes blood sugar spikes, insulin's job is to then go out there, get that blood sugar out of the blood, put it into our cells so that our cells can use it for energy. And so if we've got too much blood sugar all the time, then we have tons and tons of insulin being pumped out by our body to try and deal with that as it should. But that itself can lead to a lot of hormone imbalances. It's going to lead to estrogen excess. It can also lead to too much testosterone. And like we said, that can lead to hair loss to acne, to, and then hair growth on, on, you know, those unwanted spots. So inflammation, insulin, big piece when it comes to all chronic disease, but especially hormone imbalance as well. Stress slash cortisol. So when we are stressed or our body perceives something as stressful, cortisol is released. Cortisol is that classic chronic, is that classic fight or flight or stress hormone that we hear about a lot. And this is so not talked about enough. And I think part of the reason is because it's not something stress is not something that we can touch or feel or see, you know, it's, it's more abstract. It is what it is, but 1400 chemical reactions happen in your body as a result of stress. So something's happening when stress, you know, stress occurs. And when that is chronic and we've got chronic cortisol release that can interrupt the hormone pathways at so many different spots leading to all kinds of hormone imbalances. It's of course, more what you're genetically prone to is where that's going to start making a difference. So for some people, it's leading to more of that estrogen excess picture. Like we've talked about for some people, it's making less estrogen and making less progesterone. And then we have major issues conceiving. And that's where we see infertility come into play. It also can drive too much testosterone, like we've already talked about, but then also too little of testosterone. So stress interrupts and cortisol interrupts at so many different spots. It also increases inflammation, which is going to then put you back on, you know, that one to the left and then stress and cortisol interrupts our gut microbiome. So it's, it's just such a big piece and not emphasized enough when it comes to hormone issues. Our body is also, especially female physiology is rooted in safety. So our body's really smart to where when it thinks that there's threats or that the world is not safe, it's going to shut down its hormone productions. Cause it's like, uh Oh, the world's not safe. I definitely shouldn't be reproducing and bringing a child into the world. So we can see our hormones go on shutdown, which is a very smart response by the body, but because it thinks we're running from a tiger, but we're actually just stressed out at work. So it doesn't know the difference between being, you know, stressed out from running from a tiger or being stressed out from running from work, you know? So Stress, cortisol, huge, huge piece there. 
nutrient deficiencies. We need fats to make hormones. The cholesterol is the precursor to all of our sex hormones. So I could go on a whole tangent about how cholesterol is not as bad as people think our body and different things like blood sugar and inflammation are what turn cholesterol bad. We need cholesterol to make hormones. We need fat to make hormones. We cannot have processes, hormone pathways happen without protein and without different B vitamins and magnesium and things like that to allow those processes and those pathways to happen. So nutrient deficiencies can lead to, again, not making enough hormones, but also um, those pathways kind of getting stuck and leading to excess um, of hormones as well. Okay. So I went through a lot there and, um, the overarching theme is that it's, there's so much more upstream to look at that's then leading to downstream symptoms and downstream sex hormone imbalances. Yes, the sex hormones are probably out of balance, but we have to ask why and we have to figure out why. So that's very much what I do in my office. I do that through a comprehensive history and as well as a, you know lots of testing. So big blood panels are a lot of what I do, but I can do other hormone testing, gut testing, different things like that. But it's really important to figure out why they're happening because that's how we then solve it. So a lot of what I do to help people then solve the hormone issues and solve the hormone imbalances, as well as all the other things that are upstream is, you know, what you're putting into your mouth every day. So diet, but then lifestyle is a big piece, which we're going to talk about. And then supplements is another big thing. So the diet and the lifestyle side of things, they're the groundwork for all things health. So people can get really focused on supplements, but if we're not managing stress, if we're not sleeping well, if we aren't, you know, fueling our body with the correct foods, then it's very difficult for our body to then have proper hormone production and be able to manage those hormones um, optimally. So with the diet side of things, I know the nutritionists are going to talk about this, but it's so important. So I don't want to just skip over all of it. So both of us are going to be reiterating how important this is. And I'm sure everybody in the room knows this, but it's oftentimes, you know, there's a massive overload of information out there on the internet, on social media and things like that. So kind of in general, I like really people to think about, you know, we should be eating kind of what God gave us, what the earth gave us when something is made in a lab by chemicals, it's probably not going to be the best for us. So eating really what the earth gave us, what the world gave us, what God gave us, however you want to think about that is really important. Diversity is also really important. So that's not only diversity in the plants that you eat and the protein that you eat, but the diversity of eating all the different food groups. So it's not just, we should only eat meat. It's not just, we should only eat, you know, plants because if you think about it, it's probably just not that simple. We have protein for a reason. We've fed off of animals for years and thousands and thousands of years. And also going strict carbohydrate free is not always, you know, beneficial for some people. It might be, it might not be. And in my office, we really focus on what, you know, what to eat is, you know, tailored specifically to each patient, but we're not like big macro counters or anything like that. It's more about what's going to fuel you, what's going to help you in your case, but a really good approach is kind of what I have on this slide here. So really focusing on lots of fruits and veggies, you should eat the rainbow. Always your plate should look like the rainbow, all the different colors, bring in different phytonutrients, different antioxidants that help kill off. Um, cancer cells that help kill off and, and decrease oxidants in the body and all those different things. Protein. This is not eaten enough for lack of a better term. So I often have to tell people to eat more than I have to tell people to eat less. So protein is super, super important. And so many females are not eating enough. You should have protein at every single meal. And it should be, again, I don't count macros, but a good kind of way to measure is at least 20 to 20, 30 grams of protein at a meal is, is wonderful. All that varies on you, your health, your activity level, and all those different things. And again, I tailor that all to my patients specifically, but this is more of a, a broad presentation. So getting a good amount of protein at each meal is sufficient. It's very hard to do from plants only that plant protein is just not as bioavailable. I'm a big fan of the grass fed meats, the pasture raised organic meats, because they have completely different nutrient profiles than the animals that are conventionally raised that we've shoved into cages and fed glyphosate sprayed corn all their life. So they're different. They matter. Of course, budgets and all those things come into play, but you have to prioritize what's best for you and for your family. But that is the information as it is. 
fiber. So that's of course coming from a lot of your healthy carbohydrates, but also plants and fruit. People always think, you know, bread and pastas when they hear fiber and oats and things like that, but we get just as much, if not better fiber and nutrients from our veggies and our fruit too. Fiber itself will directly bind and pull out of it, pull estrogen out of the body. So it's very important for hormone balancing because it can help bind up those excess estrogens and pull them out of the body. Healthy fats. So like I said, we cannot make hormones without fats. So this is very, very important in perimenopause because our hormone levels start to drop. And so if we aren't then bringing in the precursors, that cholesterol or that fat to then make hormones, we're going to have even less. So they're dropping. So we need to make sure that we're giving our body enough to then produce what, you know, the proper amounts that it needs in the first place. Okay. Like I said, less of the sugar, the refined carbohydrates, seed oils, alcohol. So the, again, those things that have been made in, in labs and have been processed with chemicals and are not, you know, what nature gave us, they're probably not great for our body. They're going to raise inflammation. They're going to raise insulin levels. And like you saw in the other slides, that leads to a lot of different issues. All of those have been shown in the research to be damaging to our gut microbiome as well increased risk of cardiovascular health and cardiovascular issues and all kinds of things. So the more we can avoid the inflammatory foods, the better we can manage our hormones. So lowering inflammation is a big goal of, of what you're putting into your mouth every day. And then balancing blood sugar is another big goal as well. Okay. Diet's huge, but there's other non-negotiables and that's going to be sleep and stress management. So like we talked about stress and cortisol being such a problem when it comes to hormone issues, but then also any and all things, chronic disease, we have to manage stress. Everybody has stress. We have to manage it all kinds of different ways. We can do that <clears throat> endless research on meditation, deep breathing, yoga, time in nature, and what that does to your cortisol levels and what that does to lower your heart rate and lower blood pressure and increase your immune system, increase mood, all of those different things. Like there's just, there's no way to deny all the research that shows how beneficial these things are and how they can really help you maintain proper health. And especially in the hormone world, like we talked about cortisol will interrupt so many of those pathways and interrupt and, and dysregulate so many of those hormonal pathways. Uh, I'm a big fan of just trying to get people to do five, five minutes of deep breathing before they go to bed. So you can kind of help optimize sleep with that and kind of to kill two birds with one stone by doing some deep breathing on top of winding down for your bedtime. So big, deep belly breaths is really important. And you want your exhales to be longer than your inhales. Cause when that exhales longer, that's what actually helps lower your heart rate. And that's going to decrease that cortisol output. Lots of meditation apps out there, uh, YouTube videos. I mean, the resources are endless. I have a few headspace is my favorite meditation app and, um, insight timer is another really great one. Deep breathing breaks throughout the day, driving in your car, you can't go anywhere. So you might as well sit there and, and work on your deep breathing, deep breathing in between different meetings, just a four deep breath reset can be very, very helpful on your cortisol levels. Journaling is also great and reflective time in nature prayer. Prayer can be coupled with deep breathing as well. Time in nature can be coupled with deep breathing. So you can really optimize all of these and, and put multiple of them together. Gratitude is also wonderful and mindfulness. All of those things kind of fall under that stress management, but really help work on the mindset side of handling stress as well. Sleep optimization. So how many times have we heard six to eight hours, get six to eight hours. That's what you need. Unfortunately, that's just a false claim. It's a false idea because there's endless research on less than seven hours of sleep and the issues that it has on your health, lowering the immune system, um, causing hormone dysfunction and, um, increasing cortisol, increasing weight gain, more mental, emotional issues, so many different things that less than seven hours of sleep causes. So it's really, really a great goal to aim for being in bed around eight hours, that means you're probably sleeping for seven and a half, closer to seven and a half, eight. And that way you're getting that optimal amount. Six is not enough. It's just not true. I don't know why or where the six to eight hours thing came from, but it's just not, it's just not the truth, unfortunately. So trying to be and optimize that amount is really important too. But of course, quality matters as well. So stopping eating two to three hours before bed is really important as well. When we eat, that kicks on our metabolism. Metabolism causes our heart rate to rise and we can then not fall into deep sleep as well. 
in order to fall into deep sleep, which is primarily at the beginning of the night, your heart rate has to be low enough. And so if that heart rate is elevated from stress, first of all, that we've already talked about, but eating and your metabolism being kicked up, then it can't fall into deep sleep. So people have issues falling asleep, but then they also have issues not being able to stay asleep. And then of course, not feeling refreshed in the morning because they didn't get a lot of deep sleep. Cold and dark room, the optimal sleeping temp is like 64 degrees, which is pretty cold, but just shows that 75 degrees is not the optimal sleeping temp. So getting fans going, windows open, things like that, or your thermostat automatically dropping at night to make things colder is, is much more beneficial for sleep. You want things to be dark. You don't want the light from the hallway shining in, the light from outside shining in. Even alarm clocks have been shown in the research, those, those bright lights to inhibit sleep as well. So trying to keep everything as dark as possible. And then another really cool hack with sleep, and it's not even really a hack, it's just tapping into that circadian rhythm, is seeing sunlight in the morning. So if you can get like five to 10, 15 minutes of sunlight in your eyes in the morning, that drastically helps your sleep at night. So when we see that light or that light comes into our eyes, our body releases serotonin. Serotonin then gets converted into melatonin at night. And of course that melatonin then helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. So it's just part of that circadian rhythm day into night, but it's really, really fascinating that what you do in the morning can then in either inhibit or help you sleep at night. Okay. I don't always talk about hormone or supplements when I give talks because supplements should always, always be tailored specifically to the patient and their history and their symptoms and their labs even more so. So I have a hard time talking about supplements because what I do is very much tailoring everything specifically to that patient, their story, their history, their labs, like I said, but these are some really great supplements that can help balance hormones and can help with the really overall general health. Um, and I guess I was just feeling generous by putting the supplement slide up here because it is great information. But again, working with a professional is always really important because there are some supplements that you should not take with different medications. A lot of these on here would be pretty safe, but again, you should always work with a professional, especially when there's medications involved. And again, supplements should be tailored to your labs and to your story. That being said, magnesium is often, often depleted by stress, by alcohol, and by inflammation. So we see lots of issues with low magnesium in a lot of people. Uh, I think the stat is about 70% of the population is deficient in magnesium. So a lot of this can be helpful. There's all kinds of different magnesium types. So again, working with a professional to find the one that's best for you is really helpful, but lots of research on magnesium leading to too much, you know, too much heavy bleeding, PMS symptoms, hormone imbalances in general, vitamin B complex heavily involved in the pathways of our hormones and our sex hormones. So that can be great. Also great for energy and mood. B vitamins are found in just about every process of our body. So that can be helpful for a lot of people. Vitamin D, this is really important in hormone health, bone health, immune health. I mean, you, you can search on PubMed for any and all um, chronic issues and vitamin D has probably had research done on how it's beneficial and how it's correlated. So vitamin D can be overdone and it can be over overdosed. So having your levels checked, if you are going to supplement it is very necessary because it, it can be too much and that can cause issues with calcium loss from your bones. Okay. Omega threes and fish oils. So like we talked about, you need fat to make your hormones. And so that's where a lot of that healthy fat can come from. Fish oil can be very anti-inflammatory can also help balance blood sugar. So both of those things we've seen can lead to hormone issues. Probiotics. So Probiotic supplements are great. I prefer food to get your probiotics or food or drinks. So your, your sauerkraut, your kimchi, your kombucha, your kefir, your um, yogurt, uh, miso, tempeh, those are also fermented. So those fermented food and drinks do a much, much better job of actually influencing the gut and colonizing the gut. So those probiotic supplements we kind of see in the research, I like to call them tourists. So they often will show up influence, but then they will then leave the gut. So they don't do a great job of actually colonizing. They are just kind of influencers. So a big fan of probiotic food and drinks. I like to people, I like to have people aim for one to two, even servings of something probiotic a day. 
And just a kind of another plug on probiotic supplements, but also supplements in general, it's, it's a field that's very much taken advantage of because it's popular. So you want companies that are third-party tested that do research on their own products that practice good man manufacturing practices and things like that. Because for example, there was a study done on probiotic supplements and seven probiotic strains or seven probiotic supplements were tested and only three of the seven products contained what they actually said they contained. So lots of crap products out there and there's not a whole lot that's regulating them. So again, working with a professional who gets, gets the prescription or the professional grade supplements only, and also, you know, knows what to look out for, knows what to look for and find the quality brands is also really helpful and, and makes a big difference. When supplements are super cheap and they seem too good to be true, it's probably the truth. So quality matters. And again, working with a professional is very, very important, especially if there is medications involved. Okay. I always like to just tell people that I do offer a free 20 minute introductory visit. So for people that want to learn more about what functional medicine is, what the process looks like and you know, what's it costs and all those fun things. I offer everybody the chance to sit down with me, whether it's via the phone, uh, virtually or in person to kind of talk through that stuff and, you know, discover if it's the right fit for you. That is an option. This would be the time that I'd ask people if they have questions, but I'm not there, so I can't. But again, use that free 20 minutes then to ask some questions too, or, or shoot me an email. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I like to finish by saying, advocate for yourself, advocate for your health. It's just not right when they get, when women get told, well, it just sucks to be a woman. It just sucks to be going through perimenopause. You just got to power through the hot flashes. That's just not true. There are so many things that can be done. And there's so many people out there that want to help. Clearly you're in the right space for that. The people around you want to help. The providers want to help. So find, find what works best for you. Find the perfect fit. And again, never stop advocating for your health. Because that is that is where you know we go wrong in healthcare. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.